yeah. This is the only Apes film that did not have the same spread of toys. Many of the characters did not get their own figure. No <laughs> coloring books for this one. <laughs> Yeah, I want I want the Conquest of the Planet of the Apes coloring book is what yeah, I, I really want. I want that ape's head splattering. I want to be able to color the blood well. blue. Well, howdy there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode four of Go Ape, a podcast where we talk about the five original Planet of the Apes films. Today, we are talking about Conquest for the Planet of the Apes. Joining me... As per usual, is my good friend Oliver Ricketts. Oliver, say hello. Introduce yourself to the world. Adam, hello. Uh, go ape, more like let's go deep, because how could you not with this movie? I'm fueling up with uh, a rousing mug of Cha Cha Tree Frog Rainforest Cafe coffee, because we are uh, talking about animal supremacy here, folks. And <laughs> what's, what's more animal and supreme than coffee made at the Rainforest Cafe? Conquest for the Planet of the Apes is a weird film. I, as I explained earlier, is truly one of my favorite films of all time. Like, of all time. It is, in my humble opinion, a masterpiece. I, don't, I, do, I truly do not understand the criticism that this movie gets that it's just garbage. It's just another ape sequel. How anybody could look at this movie and think of it, even even thinking of it on the plane of like, this is a sequel to Planet of the Apes feels weird to me because it's a departure from Planet of the Apes in a big way because of how angry it feels. Mm -hmm. And it has so much to say that watching it now, it is still just as topical as it was back then um and mm -hmm. while some of the imagery maybe hasn't aged great considering some social things that have developed since then uh you can't deny that this this is a really relevant and, and profound movie this is in definitely... the same way that the first one is i i would i would completely agree the thing though that a lot of people draw a lot of criticism for this movie with and, and i get it because i agree with it to an extent is that mm. a lot of the careful veiling of social commentary, like that, like how we geniusly saw it in the first film? It, there is no getting around what this movie is trying to say, and even the events that it's trying to do, trying to depict. I mean, this movie came out in in this in 1972, uh, was made in 1971, and this was a very difficult time in the United States. Like a lot of people complain about, you know, what's going on now here in here in the states and how absolutely divided we are and everything like that. And I'm like, you look at what was going on in the late 60s and early 70s and it was bad. It was it would be it was a lot more violent, I would argue, than than even today. You had all of these race riots that were going on cuz uh, cuz I can't believe it, but like the freaking Civil Rights Act only happened in, in 63, 64. I mean, that's right. insane to me. You had the Democratic National Convention in 1968, which would have been extremely fresh in everyone's mind come, come this movie's release. And that got bloody. There were riots. And they, the, the National Guard had to be called in. It was nasty. We all saw it on television, too. And I think that was a part of it, was that a lot of that was now the Vietnam War. All of it was mm -hmm. now being put on, on television and it was like this weird mix mash, uh, mix and mesh of like you'd see all of these horrible images on TV, but yet you would listen to what was being played on the radio, and you were listening to the Bee Gees, <laughs> you know. And and it was it was such a weird time in American history in the 1970s. And what was interesting is that this this is, in my humble opinion, Paul Dane's masterpiece. And it's so interesting because he's British, and how he looked at what was going on in America and and wrote this apes movie, he realized he had to continue the story from the very ending of Escape, right? The, the mm. whole idea that now there's this new ape, which in that film's name was Milo, um, and now it's Caesar. This film thus far had the smallest budget of the Planet of the Apes movies, which is insane to me that this movie has a smaller budget than Escape. It, it is perhaps in a lot of ways... Like, looking at it, like, I, from a practical, like, filmmaking standpoint, I can look at this and say, like, this was probably a little cheaper to make. 
it is the most complete and expensive looking one. And maybe that's technology coming along. Maybe that's because we're like Escape. We're existing in, you know, a modern landscape. A so modern landscape. It takes much place of a in need the, to build sets. It takes place in the 1990s. The majority of the outdoor scenes were shot in around the University of Calivar- California, the Irvine campus. Mm-hmm. Um, which was brand spanking new. So the architecture within the film was very modern, sleek looking, and I think Honestly, gives the film a very unique look. Having them be in buildings, period, yeah, uh, rather than in the jungle and in the desert, does make it look like a more expensive piece. Because even when we talk about battle, and we've moved mm-hmm. somewhat away from that, and I mean, battle has the school bus, but uh, <laughs> yeah. this looks more expensive. I think a lot of that, though, comes down to the brilliant direction of J. Lee Thompson. J. Lee Thompson is one of the best directors, too, was one of the best directors out there. He was actually slated to direct the original, uh, and he would have done a great job. I don't think it would have mm-hmm. been that radically different of a movie had he been the director behind it. But since it was in production hell, he moved on and was directing other things. He directed one of my favorite Westerns of all time and, ironically, one of my favorite giant monster movies of all time, White Buffalo, with Charles Bronson. It's a great film. He also directed his probably his most famous film is uh, Guns of Navarone. Uh, mm. he, he directed that. What was another film that he made? Directed the original Cape Fear, the one that Martin Scorsese remade. He's a, he was very a very competent director, very skilled director, and had a really great visual eye for captioning uh, for capturing action because he went on in his later part of his career he sort of got roped into canon films and made a lot of the death wish movies and right. you know stuff like that which as as ridiculous as those movies are you can't deny that the action in them isn't good and fun uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know the use of lighting in the film i think is is unbelievably expertly done the ape costumes the way how they sort of blend the apes have the color while the while the mm-hmm. humans don't. They're all black and gray, very fascistic looking, very deliberately mm-hmm. so. Uh, the weird lights on the on the computer panels and everything like that, which were all stolen from other productions. Like everything in this sure. movie, from the uniforms, the uniforms in this film were actually taken from Irwin Allen's his TV show, uh, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, which is I love. That is the... something that is so cool about Planet of the Apes is how many of the how many things in these films are just them saying well what do we have yes you know yeah we, we like, need to make important sci-fi what is here for us to use all the chairs uh you know when they're doing the auction scene all of those mm-hmm. chairs were chairs taken from the spaceship from the first planet of the apes movie <laughs> all of the uh insignias of the ape control uniforms are insignias taken from a uh, voyage to the bottom of the sea and uh, the time tunnel, uh, all the equipment and go and the in ape control that that set with all the computers and everything is all all of that stuff is just stuff taken from uh, Irwin Allen's the time tunnel. So well, to me, that's like that's filmmaking at its finest because I love filmmaking it. is about solving problems. And you talk about what's the successor to Planet of the Apes? It's Star Wars, right? Mm-hmm. I don't think Star Wars has ever functioned on that level of like brain power. Uh, especially now because they have infinite money to do whatever yes. they want to whatever do. Whatever they want. You don't. Yes. <laughs> you don't see creative problem solving like that anymore. Well, I did and an that... entire video about this, Oliver. I when I was doing that short-lived show, Stupefied Film History, I did an entire mm-hmm. episode devoted to Conquest for the Planet of the Apes and the production of it. As a filmmaker, as somebody in that world, that is what this is about. That's what we're doing here. We're solving problem and that that's all that directing is that's all that being a member of the crew is and this is a key example of like don't forget this is still a merchandising giant this is still a really important piece of like film history and it is made on that shoestring budget of people grabbing we have some chairs we have some jumpsuits we can make something here at the location i think helps a lot too I, and i also think For the sure. decision if you if you look at the the revolution sequence there's a lot of handheld camera work in that which mm-hmm. back in the back in the late 60s and early 70s was like revolutionary it, it's very deliberately like if you look at like some of the footage of like the the 1968 Democratic National Convention, some of those race riots that were that were going on, Malcolm X and all that and all that crap, the Black Panther movement, almost like shot for shot, they mimic that 
to to create is, this look. It is interesting because it's not how current day you would choose to film a riot. Mm-hmm. But it makes it makes a lot of sense, especially in an era where you were getting just basically raw footage of this stuff beamed into your home on television. This is how people of the time are used to seeing a riot. Mm-hmm. You know, if mm-hmm. you were to watch footage of a, a riot in real life, it looks like this. It doesn't look like a movie. It's what it's one of my favorite riot scenes actually is, is in this yeah. film. I just, I just love how it's so simple, but yet it's not, it's so it, it, that, that shaky cam, the especially in the unrated cut which we'll get into later it's some of the gore that you see in it and i'm like it just feels so raw and so visceral and that's one reason why i love violence in in movies particularly from the late 60s through about 1975 it's so mm-hmm. raw and so gritty and and in my humble opinion despite the fact that hey this actually technically not as much blood on screen or you know people getting their arms chopped off and things like that it feels worse uh, my I my favorite example feel... of that is Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, well, there's a there's a classic. I mean, I I do feel that as technology has moved on and as we've gotten better at things like blood squibs and then CGI blood, mm-hmm. violence in movies has actually gotten a lot worse. Like, and not like oh visceral. The right. quality of violence that you see in movies mm-hmm. is worse because in the '60s and early '70s you had to try for it. There was right. and, and it. It feels raw, I guess, by nature of, like, how much is happening in camera and, and like, how much you're trying to achieve this without the technology to back you. And, like, you look at the shaky cam, too. It's like, now we would use probably, like, an image stabilizer to kind of smooth it out just a little bit. Not completely get rid of the shake, but, you know, just to kind of sure. make it a little smoother. Back then, they didn't have any of that shit. And because of that, there's some shots in this where the camera is literally going all over the place and you can almost not tell what's on screen and Mm -hmm. it's cut so quickly with other shots that you lose track of what's happening in this orgy of violence. And it's very deliberately done. And I think a very deliberate decision by Jay Lee Thompson, Hey, we don't have this budget to make an Epic. This has to be an Epic, but we don't have the budget to make an Epic. So what am I going to do? We're going to move the camera in. We're going to make it, very uptight, up close, personal, and that's going to make up for our lack of hundreds Funny of. Funny enough, thinking about Planet of the Apes, he also did what Matt Reeves does years later when he's directing Cloverfield. In some um, ways, yeah, this isn't a found you know, footage movie, that, but yeah. sure. But Cloverfield is a found footage movie because the budget isn't there, right? You know, and it and it is that like close shake. This is going to be off-putting to you because your brain is going to try to to handle this. I discovered one reason why this movie had such a radically kind of like different visual feel to the other Planet of the Apes movies, even the one that came after this. And that's because this was shot, one of like two movies I can name, that was shot with a process called Todd AO35. Now, Todd AO was a film processing company uh, they made cameras and stuff like that that specialized in 70 millimeter film cleopatra was shot in this tons of movies were shot in todd ao and what was great about todd ao is that it was a widescreen process where you didn't have to use anamorphic lenses you just could use a regular mm-hmm. spherical lens and you had a national uh, natural aspect ratio of roughly two to zero to one well come the late 60s and through the 70s 70 millimeter was kind of going out the window and Panavision was really taking over the scene in terms of processing and, and, and Technicolor and Deluxe and all of them. So to kind of compete with that, Todd A.O. made this 35 millimeter process and they said, let's use it on this film as an experiment. It is an unbelievably rich movie. It looks fantastic. In fact, this is my favorite looking out of all the Planet of the Apes movies. And I think it was I think it was just because it was it's the only one of the Apes films shot in this process in a different process outside of Panavision regular 35 millimeter film. It was this one. Sure. What it has going for it too is if you're not somebody who is interested in films because of how it's made, but you are a really big science fiction person. Mm-hmm. Um this is deep sci-fi. This is the social message. This is 5 seconds in the future. Um you know, it, you can't get more thought-provoking science fiction than something like this because 
all of the motives are so human. Unfortunately, these are things that we see in history over and over again with human beings. And it's actually not that much of a stretch to have a movie like this where this happens. Right. Um, it just wouldn't be monkeys. Yeah, it just wouldn't be. Exactly. Which is all a part of the theme of this is a, a repeat in cycle of violence, which seems to be a continuing sort of theme throughout the Planet of the Apes movies is because of escape. The time the, the timeline has now changed. Aldo isn't going to be a thing. It is now Caesar. Caesar mm -hmm. is going to lead this, and it happens now. They had to... Caesar is now leading the apes. The apes have now started a revolution. Humanity is still going to blow themselves up, and it's just yep. going to be another loop. What's so cool about Planet of the Apes is, like, no matter what, we mm -hmm. always go back... And even the new films... We go back to that ultimate certainty. That bomb is going off in Benin. Yeah. No matter what, across the yeah. board. And Every it's not the apes, it's it's people who made the bomb. Yes. Well, that's what's that's what's fascinating about that and that's one of the the elements of the film as well. Would the apes do any better? And the film at least one cut of the film blatantly says no. It's just going to be the same horse shit over again. The film is dark to reflect that. Now, this whole thing, though, the whole idea that, okay, now Caesar is going to, this 18-year-old chimp is now going to lead this revolution uh, to overthrow humanity, essentially. Not overthrow humanity, just overthrow the city to begin mm. a bigger picture. Well, it's it's reminiscent of, of say, a Che Guevara, uh, a teenage Big time. rebellion leader. Big time. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and uh, a lot of people complain about this movie, including me, is that the premise of this movie is absolutely ridiculous. How did the apes evolve this rapidly in 20 years? You know? Right. Uh, they explained that, um, just like in the other timeline, one of our ships that went to outer space came back, brought a virus that wiped out all, basically all the dogs and cats in the world are dead. Mm. Uh, which in of itself is ridiculous, but whatever. That's some good science fiction pulp. I don't care what anybody says. Uh, you're right. It's just ridiculous. And so we wanted companions. So we started talking with apes. And then suddenly <laughs> we realized that the apes were smarter also, than dogs and cats. That is such a strange thing just because... A monkey can rip you to shreds. Yes. A, a dog, maybe a dog, but depending on the size, a dog or a cat, you know, what happened to rats? Let's get a pet rat. I know, How about right? a lizard, man? A ferret, you know? Yeah. Not an ape. Uh, I've, I've been told uh, by my landlord that ferrets are the new dog. Bold claim. Um, seems like they would have been a good substitute. We discover as we go along that what has happened is that we figured out pretty quickly that these guys are a lot smarter than dogs and cats. And we can treat, we can not just teach them tricks, we can teach them how to do things. And so rapidly they become slaves, essentially. And we start seeing the same class structure we saw within the first Planet of the Apes movie. So gorillas do a lot of the heavy lifting. They do a lot of the grunt work. The chimps tend to do more... You see them work in a, in a barber shop. You see them working in restaurants. You kind of see them... They are some, precise workers. Yes. And then we see the orangutans, which ironically, there's only like five orangutans in this entire movie. It's mainly chimps and gorillas in the film. But you see the orangutans, what are they doing? They're working in libraries. They're, 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 they're working... They're doing the bureaucratic grunt work. This is the thing about science fiction, though, and I said this in our in our first recap, but a lot of good science fiction is just, okay, we're going to stretch the envelope a little bit. Please get on board with me so I can show you what would happen if we did this. Mm -hmm. um, and that is ultimately what, what this is. Can you buy that this happened in 20 years? Probably not. But if you do, then... Let me tell you what would really happen if this were the case. It's not. It's not just that, and I think that's that's the thing that makes this movie so good, in my opinion, is how quickly I forget that giant logic leap. I think it speaks to the actors, the directing, and the writing that you. I I forgot about it within the first ten minutes of this movie. I was on board. I I was I forgot on board about with it until journey. just now. Roddy McDowell 
comes back as Caesar. Mm -hmm. Here's a 40-something-year-old man playing an 18-year-old chimpanzee, and it works. I argue, and I've gotten laughed, I've gotten laughed at for saying this, and but I mean it. I think this is Roddy McDowell's greatest performance in anything he's ever done. Anything he's ever done. He's been in a lot of movies. Well, he's given a lot of good is... performances in movies. But his performance in this film, it, he has to go through every emotion under the sun. In one scene, he goes through every emotion under the sun rapidly. And then, and then, it's an unbelievably physically demanding film. Caesar's jumping around, running all over the mm -hmm. place in this movie. And it's so interesting how he gets to play his own offspring. You know, how he played Cornelius right. in the previous right. films. How he was able to take some of what Cornelius was, put it into this film, and yet make a totally new character just using Cornelius as kind of like a backdrop to his own, to, to Caesar. I do think that they play with the Cornelius thing quite a bit Mm -hmm. um, because, because there are multiple times when you could look at Caesar and say, like, in, undisputably villain by the end, which which is would be detrimental to to the film, because you do want us to understand why we're having a rebellion and that these people have been mistreated. We love uh, Cornelius and Zira that if you're a fan of this franchise, you love them. Mm -hmm. And there are moments even when. Caesar is at his most violent and especially at the end when he gives the speech he looks at the camera for a second you're looking at Cornelius you know a, a, the same way that you would a real life person's son right and I think often they also pair him with an ape that looks like Zira because they know about that fondness that we have for them bringing that back to humanity every everything is connected to something else it's a loop it's a very interesting, cool fucking thing. It is. Um, and thinking about, you know, th this being one of the great performances, I think where we are in cinema now, and, and I'm including the later Apes films, Caesar is one of the most important characters in science fiction. And yes, a big part of that is thanks to Andy Serkis and his take on the same character. Which is also but, an awesome take, by the way. Incredible. Yeah, it, that to me, like that character feels real. But do we even get that if this is not the movie that they go back to to remake for Rise of the Planet of the Apes? Which is uh, which is true. You brought something up there that's really important. Rise of the Planet of the Apes is is a spiritual remake of this movie. Correct. Every performance in this movie is good. Even even the bad guy, uh, Governor Breck. He gives some really chilling performances in this. You also have um, Culp, who is the head of Ape Security, I believe. And just mm -hmm. how cold he says everything. Every line that that man says in this film is, is cold. And arguably, I think he's the best part of the next movie, too. But every every line he says is so cold, so calculated, very Nazi, dare I say. Yeah. Because because what was what was so scary about the Nazis is how they did all of these horrible atrocities, all these horrible things, and did it with such a cold, bureaucratic, calculated ruthlessness, almost scientific. Yeah, like I love I love the part where where Caesar you know hides with the orangutans in that cage, so that way they can you know bring him in and bring him into the system, so he can sort of hide amongst his own kind. The, the best way to hide yourself is to hide right out in the open kind of deal. And mm -hmm. I love how they realize, so we've discovered a problem uh, with our records. Uh, we had a shipment from Borneo come in where they had three, uh, three or four male orangutans and one male chimpanzee. Yeah, what's the problem? There are no chimpanzees in Borneo. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. Let's break down what actually happens in this film. So we jump 20 years in the future, roughly 20 years, because I believe Caesar mm -hmm. is either he's either 18 or 21 years old when this movie in, in, in terms of the film itself. We have Armando play, played by Ricardo Montalban. He gives a fantastic performance in this, too. 
right? He's sort of he's sort of like that last bit of humanity in Caesar is right. with is with Armando and what they end up having to do with Armando in the end how Armando dies is awful <laughs> well in a lot of ways it does remind me of a a pa kent to a superman right mm -hmm. where those the superman was an alien with all this great power and he lands and he happens to be picked up by a kind compassionate person mm -hmm. and a lot of the alternative takes on superman say a homelander or a bright burn explore the idea of like well what if you didn't have that human concept to instill a good person in you right um but better yet this is almost asking what if that humanity got snatched away violently you know mm -hmm. how does that shape the person that you are and how you use your power but the only reason why they go to the city is because Armando wants to promote the circus, which apparently is a dying thing. It just died, which in itself is dangerous. And then all of the stuff happens because Caesar, being the young teenager he is, mm -hmm. lets a bit of emotion out, and he screams during, during that scene where this poor chimpanzee, exhausted, is sitting down on a curb with all these books and everything in his arms, and... The ape control is like, you have to go. You have to move. And he can't move. And so he ends up kind of lashing out a little bit. They they tase him. And then they eject him with something. We don't know what it is, but they inject him with it and then wrap him up in, in chains. And Caesar shouts, you lousy human bastards. Which is such a corny line to say out loud. But in context with the movie, it works brilliantly. Uh, it is chilling because there's... And we even see Armando have a hard time. It's phrased in a way that you cannot walk it back. Yes. Why would a human being say that? Armando puts up a good fight on it. I do I do like it because it, it is plausible that Armando would shout something like that. Sure. Um, knowing knowing his character and everything like that. But what he does for Caesar, he loves Caesar. He loves him. That as Caesar has grown up, Armando almost looks at Caesar dare I say, like a son. Of course. And I love that. I love that, because clearly Caesar, Caesar doesn't know who his dad is. He, he knows of the story, but he mm -hmm. doesn't know who his dad is. He doesn't know who his mom is. He just has Armando. And Armando has made Caesar who he is thus far. That is violently ripped away from him. I love how terrified Caesar is during, during those entire scenes. I love the fact that you see Caesar crying. Mm -hmm. and and groveling and and desperately clinging to Armando during those sequences. It's a great performance. You uh, if somebody told me that that actor was 40 years old, I never would have been convinced. He's acting like a kid that age would. And that's part of what makes this performance so incredible. Um I mean, and also I find grief and loss are not emotions that I think a lot of actors can accurately portray. Mm -hmm. It is very easy to go either way too over the top or to understate it too much. Um, but this feels real. Oh, my God. The scene, the scene where he, Caesar hears, just hears, he overhears, which is a whole huge layer of this, is that he can hear and understand everyone and everything, but he can't say a word. I have no mouth, but I must scream. Caesar just happens to overhear that that crazy monkey man jumped out of a window and Caesar quickly realizes that, oh my God, it's Armando. And you have Lisa, who is the the, the love interest in this movie. Um, she just puts a hand, again, kind of a parallel back to Zira, a slight hand over his, and he just pets it. A very Cornelius thing. He just pets it and then goes mm -hmm. off. And he looks at one of the signs that he puts up. And I swear to God, I teared up in this scene. The performance that Roddy McDowell gives is so powerful, so good. You see him just cry. He's got tears streaming down his face and you see him like shaking. And then as it goes on, it suddenly changes to, it slowly morphs itself into pure, unadulterated rage. And you see it slowly change. 
and he screams to the top of his lungs in anger. And then quickly he has to bite down on his hand because that's a human thing. Apes don't do that. Mm -hmm. And he has to remember that. He has to ring himself back in. And then he runs off. And from that point forward, that's the, that's the point of no return for Caesar right there. He's seen all of these atrocities and everything like the, uh, the ape control sequence where they're doing the training training yep. of the apes that's rough yep. i mean it's it's hard you're shooting flamethrowers at the gorillas oh, for it, God's it's, sake. it's actually incredibly difficult to watch and you hear them shouting no over that's a consistent thing throughout this thing is is humans no. shouting no yeah uh which is well, huge. Per, perhaps the most important words in this entire franchise yeah you know what i think you're right no that is what yep, kickstarted no. all of it yeah it, it is for sure what kickstarted all of it, and it is a recurring thread even as the franchise goes on now. Mm -hmm. Well, th that whole ape control sequence is genius because it establishes several things that come up later within the movie. It establishes central control, right? This is mm -hmm. this is where the seat of power is. This is where all the apes are. This is where the training happens. Uh, it also establishes that machine that they use to torture apes. And then... It also establishes just how horrific and clinical like the, the the breeding is of this. You know, it's it be, and it's interesting because we look at these are animals. We do this to animals in our society. We still do. We breed dogs, we breed cats, we breed cows, we breed everything, right? For sure. And, but but suddenly we're seeing this through the point of view of Caesar. Well, suddenly you have an, an intelligent, cognizant thing mm -hmm. undergoing what we do every day to animals yes yes and and there's that part where caesar gets thrown into into that cage essentially with i think it was three or four other male chimps and he gets handed a single banana instead and this is the genius of it instead of everyone fighting over this banana which i think is what the humans were expecting caesar splits it into four chunks so they all have something and mm -hmm. And I said this to you off camera, but it is those chimps in that cage with him that because of this act become like his lieutenants when the revolution yeah. begins. They are the ones that sort of lead the other sections of this riot. Mm -hmm. And because it can't just be Caesar. So so you see like some of them will attack around the flank or start attacking the the riot the the riot control and the flank and stuff like that. Those those are led by these chimps. And I'm like that's something I did not notice until this most recent viewing of the film. And I'm like that's awesome. It's one of those things it's always incredible when a movie is layered enough that you get a detail like that mm -hmm. that much later on. But, it, but I suppose that is like studying uh, a real-life event in many ways. Yeah. Because what is history is just breaking down the details of like, well, why did this happen? And who are these people? And how is this connected to that? Right. Um, and so a realistic retelling of, of a riot or a big social change would have elements like that. Although my favorite sequel is Beneath, I think this is the most emotionally dense one um yes. in, in the most layered especially with the real world context um but also just in, in a performance of like taking a character from one point to another mm -hmm. oh this is this is it i have the note right here the first ape to be shot by the army is the ape that burned down the restaurant yeah and another one was was with caesar in ape control that was it oh that was it because you have that ape that works in a restaurant that was like stealing knives and yep. it, that he would just steal a knife here and there and then bring it to Caesar and stuff like that. He was the first ape to be shot in this whole thing. And Caesar sees that. And that's what gets him angry. Cause he knows those guys. Yes. He knows these guys. Yeah. It's just, uh, it's, it's so what I think is one of the most brilliant casting decisions ever is you have McDonald who is an African American and he becomes not necessarily the voice of humanity, but the voice of reason throughout this whole well, thing. Well, one of the most difficult things in the movie to watch in a real world context is McDonald telling Caesar, as a former slave, yes, consider consider this. Um, 
this has happened to my people as well. Do you think this is this violence is the answer? And it or makes can him, you see how history is repeating right now and it can repeat again? It makes him the perfect arbiter of this whole thing, too. Because he's lived on both sides. Yes. And it, there's that great scene where he's obviously... I wouldn't say he's on the ape's side. He's on Caesar's side for a while. Mm. But he's certainly more sympathetic to the apes. And that's probably why he knows his history. Because he's a smart man. The whole reason why Breck is the way he is is because he he has a suspicious feeling that Caesar is out there somewhere throughout the entire thing. It's one reason why ape security is the way it is. But right. because they know what the future is going to be. So therefore we need to crack down on anything the apes do immediately. Immediately because history is repeating itself. Again, it's the whole circle. And of yet themes stopping in it. history, stopping what's going to happen is only going to ensure that it happens. It, that it happens again. Yeah, yeah. It's, you it's, can't fight uh, your destiny. It's so good. It's so good. But and make, something that is discussed at the end with, with this idea of you can't fight your destiny when Caesar says, if God wills for man to be submissive to ape, then that's what will happen. The part where, where Breck orders, they find out that Caesar, Caesar is that ape. Mm -hmm. Which is so genius that he was hiding right under their noses the whole time. That's so genius that he would hide there. You know, it, I, I love that. McDonald is, is giving Caesar over to be terminated, essentially, right? And he doesn't want to. And he looks down at Caesar, who can understand everything that McDonald says, but McDonald doesn't know it's him yet. Mm -hmm. He says to Caesar, like you would talk to a dog, you know, how we, we often talk to our dogs, where he just goes, I wish you could understand that I... And he cuts himself off, and he's full of emotion. But the camera lingers on Caesar. And you see in Caesar's eyes, again, this is why acting with eyes is important. It's almost hard to explain because it's so brilliant. The acting is so good in that. S Caesar closes his eyes, takes in a deep breath, and says, I understand Mr. McDonald. And you realize in that moment the reason why Caesar looked so afraid, closed his eyes, and took in that deep inhale. That this is the biggest risk Caesar has ever taken in his life. Is saying Without question. that line. I understand Mr. McDonald. And it's ch I get chills. I get chills. I'm getting chills just recalling the scene in my head. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not just a good line. The entire sequence is full of some amazing dialogue. The only means left to us. Revolution. But it's doomed to failure. Maybe, but it's doomed to failure. Caesar says, maybe. And then he was like, but you'll keep trying and the next and the next and we'll keep trying. And then it, it ends with Caesar going, you of all people should understand that we cannot be free until we have power. Now we go back to cycle of violence. You'll keep trying. Mm. You'll keep trying. Yeah, it will. You'll fail this time. Maybe. And the next. Perhaps. But we'll keep trying. You of all people should understand that we cannot be free until we have power. That's the, that's the chain of lines. It's so, so good. <laughs> and so real world relevant. Yeah. This does not have to be a monkey. No, it doesn't need to be a monkey. <laughs> and, and, oh, that whole sequence too where Caesar is tortured. They, they well, that him. is that is chilling. That oh. is the most human that this character gets because we can all identify with pain. Yeah, physical pain. Well, uh, Caesar that is, is a difficult screaming. sequence. He is screaming bloody murder writhing. in that sequence, and he's writhing, and his entire back is arching off of the table. And I remember, I when I had this on, I was at home. But like the first day I watched this, or one day I was watching this, and my mother was on the computer, and I remember that scene played, and my mother said, "Adam, turn that off," because she this was just, too she much. couldn't. It was too much, and I'm like, "No, I want to keep watching. <laughs> I want to see what happens." And I love. I uh, it's 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 hard, and and again, unbelievably physically demanding on Roddy McDowell, and he pulls it off expertly. 
Oh, you can because you can totally buy that that person, that ape, I should say, is going through excruciating pain. And I love how they don't try to make Caesar higher than thou in that sequence right. as well, because he does cave. He does. He says, right. "Have pity." It is a little ridiculous, though. I, I'm not going to lie, because this movie does have ridiculous moments in but it that make me go, "Huh." For for all of the ridiculousness, we must remember that this is a franchise where gorillas <laughs> take over the entire universe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is true. And ride horses with guns. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and so we must accept the silliness to to understand the nuance. Right, right. McDonald saves Caesar, and Caesar realizes that he has because he sh cuts off all the power to that mm -hmm. machine. And so Caesar pretends that he's being killed at the last second and that he dies. It is a little ridiculous that, one, they didn't bother to check the dials on the machine to realize that they weren't going up. It's a little ridiculous <laughs> on, that, on that. Well, could then, that be an act of hubris, though? The other thing that drives me insane is they don't feel the ape's pulse to make sure he's dead. This goes back to Walter White getting found out because he left a book of poems that had his name Heisenberg in it in his bathroom for anyone well, to see thing... while still putting rice in it in an electrical outlet. This is hubris and thinking that the job is done. I don't I don't think I don't think so. I think this uh, that example in 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 Breaking Bad I think is a genuine example of great writing. You know, very mm. very thoughtful put together writing. Well, I think in Conquest for the Planet of the Apes they just needed an escape. It's <laughs> they, this just they this is an accident. Plot, a, pl <laughs> a plot device really quick so that way they could get to the revolution. I love the relationship and how it evolves between Cornel uh, Cornelius uh freaking um caesar and, and lisa i love how the whole rebellion starts it happens too quickly in the movie i, I will give the critics that it's way too quick this yeah. movie could have benefited from another 15 minutes of For just sure. building to the revolution especially because of the dark tense place where it goes yes yeah the longer that you hold us in that the more that that's gonna hit i love i love caesar gathering all of the apes bringing to him all of the the machine him teaching them how to use a blowtorch and i love i love how they're handing him axes and they're handing him meat cleavers and so which first off just the image of the meat cleaver is enough to yep ugh, make you go oh, chills God. but it's 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 very effective i love the the whole the montage where suddenly it'll be an ape doing something the ape will look over and the camera will like pan over and you'll just see caesar watching them and that tells them, okay, you know what? I'm just going to do this little act of defiance. And it just mm -hmm. starts off with these little acts of defiance. I'm going to drop these books all over the place. Uh, you know what? I'm going to mess up this guy's shoe. <laughs> Instead of shining it, I'm going to make it all, I'm going to cover it, cover a sock and soot and everything. And eventually it leads to a restaurant being burned down. It's, a, it's an escalation of sure. the whole of, of violence and i it, it, again it's it's i love the editing the editor in me loves the editing of that i love it how it'll it'll cut to a close up of caesar just watching them and you see in his eye oh the anger in his eyes the the act the what Roddy McDowell is able to do with just his eyes is phenomenal <laughs> well fact... in, in a way that still goes back to that is the heart of this franchise is that there are people behind that makeup feeling yeah. all of these emotions oh yeah yeah if only that was about 15 minutes longer and we really got to see i don't care if it was even like over the span of like two or three months mm -hmm. or so you know it Not... fails almost in the same way that a movie like the dark knight rises has one achilles heel which is that we needed 15 more minutes of batman trying to get out of this hole we needed 15 more mm -hmm. minutes building up to this rebellion. Yeah. Because then that that place where you get at the end, this, I don't want to call it an emotional catharsis, but in a lot of ways that is what it is. Uh, you feel that. When the revolution begins, it is uh, almost, uh, and I said it at the beginning of this, of this, this podcast, orgy-esque levels of violence. Yeah. Awesome. Exploited <laughs> levels of violence. <laughs> it is awesome. And I might add, remember the basis of this franchise is, isn't it cool when monkeys have guns? And you know what? Even when it is this serious and this violent, 
it is still cool when monkeys have guns. Well, there's there's a lot of uh, I love it because what'll happen, what happens early on within the violence is, is genius, and J. Lee Thompson is genius at doing this. He did this a lot in the Guns of Navarone, where there'll suddenly be an explosion of violence, and then it'll go dead silent for a while. Yep. And that in that dead silence, there is a fuck ton of tension there. And uh, the the scene that comes to my mind is they sort of beat up some of the some of the riot control people and they call in the army, and you have the 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 pe- the army sort of lining up, right? And they line up in that street. And you go, they've got the riot gear ready to go and their guns are ready, and the camera just lingers on them listening. It's it, there's almost no sound coming from the speakers at all, and then the apes show up, and even when mm-hmm. the apes show up. It's dead quiet as the apes are slowly getting towards them. And all the only thing that you hear throughout the whole thing is a guy over the megaphone shouting, no. And I'm like, this Repetitively. is Repetitively. Yes. Yep. And I'm like, this is good. This is good. I love the fact that it's all dimly lit at night. You know, at the, when, a, when a gun fires, you see the muzzle flash and it'll yep. illuminate the apes for like a little bit. And and it just sort of adds to the chaos of the whole thing. You've got flares being shot, uh, gas canisters going off. You have apes being beaten up with with riot batons. You have apes being shot. You have uh, you have humans being shot in the whole thing. You have humans being beat to death uh, with bats and everything like that. You have them getting cut and sliced with knives and everything like that. And I'm like, this is an orgy of violence. This is what a revolution is. A revolution is not a the american revolution was like an exception (laughs) revolutions are like nasty they They are are not carefully organized battles they are and this is it's ironically from a communist but Mao Zedong said a great thing a revolution uh it isn't (laughs) it isn't men sitting around in in rooms discussing politics and discussing philosophy a revolution is an act of violence I can tell that's what this movie, that movie probably even took that quote and it was like, no, we're going to run with that. Even, even in a theatrical cut, it's unbelievably, it's unbelievably violent. Uh, and it all leads to Caesar storming ape control as Caesar is using a blowtorch to, to open the, to open the doors. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love how they're like, how does he low? How does he know how to do this? <laughs> and everything. And and Breck says a line that I I, I generally like like it, it it's so over the top but it works in the in the confines of the film he goes this will be the end what happens here today will echo throughout the entire world and those who are left will be the weakest humans of all this will be the end of human civilization as we know it and the world will belong to a planet of apes yep and then as soon as he finishes that the door is kicked open and Caesar comes running in to ape control with an M16 in his hand and shoots It's monkey everybody. time baby that's it. <laughs> now in the You've unrated cut You've had your cut, time we're going to hunt you for sport now. In the unrated cut Oliver in that scene it's even it's a lot worse. Uh in 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 that scene um it happens in in the theatrical cut, I believe this happens. The apes within ape control start saying, you know what? We're going to join them. We're going to start rebelling. And so they start rebelling, and Breck gives the order to shoot them, shoot them all. And he screams it. And they do. They get shot in the unrated version. They they don't just get shot, Oliver. You see them. You see one of them get shot in the head and blood go everywhere. They are by viscerally getting, murdered. They are murdered. And and at one point, one of them is just wounded. Breck takes a pistol, walks up to that ape, and shoots him right in the head. Which, we must acknowledge, is wild for a franchise of movies that is making most of its money mm-hmm. by selling toys. Yes, yes. This is the only apes film that did not have the same spread of toys. Many of the characters did not get their own figure. No coloring books for this one. <laughs> yeah, I want I want the Conquest of the Planet of the Apes coloring book is what yeah, I, I really want. I want that ape's head splattering. I want to be able to color the blood well, blue. I think I think this is a good time to actually really talk about the unrated cut because mm-hmm. it really comes out. It's the same movie, essentially, up until this point. 
when the when right. the when the revolution begins, it almost becomes a different movie. You can see an abrupt tonal shift at the end of the theatrical cut. Yes. Because it yep. is dour, it is depressing, it is violent, and then we end on this very uplifting speech almost within the next breath of Caesar's peak of villainy. During the test screenings of Conquest for the Planet of the Apes, it became rather apparent that they went a little too dark. For the record, Paul Dane and J. Lee Thompson and everyone on this film, I don't know how they thought this, but they genuinely did. They thought they were just making another G-rated movie. I don't think they realized until they were looking at the post-production of this film that, oh shit, we did a little bit too good of a job. <laughs> and and uh because you know parents were taking their children out of the test out of the theaters because it was too violent and then just to add insult to injury the mpaa said we're giving this an x certificate which would have ultimately i think been better for the longevity of this film me too <laughs> but financially and commercially what a disaster it would be a total disaster and especially in 1972 20th century fox needed this money and so suddenly they're like, shit, shit. Well, we can't go back and reshoot anything. We don't have the money to go back and reshoot anything. So what they did was Paul Dane quickly said, well, here's what we'll do. We'll bring Roddy McDowell in to, sh to record audio of a new speech, change the ending to make it a little more hopeful, a little more peaceful, and we'll go through the action portions of this movie and cut out some of the more violent elements of the film and this cut the theatrical cut with the second speech of caesar saying and now we've seen the birth of the planet of the apes which is a great line that is the version i grew up on that is the version that almost everybody grew up on that was the theatrical cut of the movie that's what was that what was readily was available. the movie yes yeah yeah and i understand the idea of that second speech because what it does is it sort of affirms that the apes will be better we are going to make this different. This won't repeat itself. We are going to be better. It also lays the char the groundwork for what the character becomes later. In because, battle, especially. Yeah. Yes. It ends the movie with Caesar being more of a, a just leader type mm -hmm. of figure. Less of a Che Guevara. Um, I don't want to say Jesus, but, you know. The, well, there's the messiah elements savior. to this. this I mean, the, you sure. look at the character arc. It, it's a messiah character arc it's, it's there's stuff of that in there and uh it goes along with the religious aspects too that we saw throughout the other films and stuff as well but the original cut which is the unrated cut and i didn't know this thing existed but it was never released on vhs it was never released on anything but lo and behold oliver the 40th anniversary blu-rays come out i pop in the one for conquest and suddenly, mm -hmm. the first menu that pops up is says, do you want to watch the unrated cut or the theatrical cut? Notice how the theatrical <laughs> cut is second. And I'm like, what is this? What is this? What a find. And I, I watched the unrated cut and was blown away how much more effective the unrated cut is. It just shows you how different the ending is. It, it, the big difference is the ending. And there's, a, there's more violence and bloodshed. Well, an ending of a film arguably, changes uh, what a film is. Arguably, a lot more bloodshed. <laughs> I didn't realize, Oliver, how much bloodshed was in that until I watched the theatrical cut of the movie and then watched the, the unrated cut just to kind of compare them back and forth. And actually, I made notes here of that. But the big... If you listen to the music cues in the theatrical cut, they're quite bombastic. Uh, who did the music for this? Album? Well, I think the, the Tom score Scott. of all the Apes films is very good. Um, Tom Scott's is very good. His score for this is very good. Very minimalistic, very bombastic, a lot of heavy drum, use of drums and stuff like that, especially during the the revolution sequence. Very tribal almost. Yeah, yeah. And in the theatrical cut, that drum music is what plays a lot throughout the, the revolution. In the unrated cut, it's almost just like this unnerving drone that plays throughout the yeah. entire thing like it, it is unbelievably un it's it's very unnerving i mentioned one of the ones before uh breck shooting one of the apes just point blank in the head and you seeing it and well, i mean i mean that is, i mean that is alarming for the time 
And uh, Oliver, I'm not kidding. You see the ape's face on like a with blood. That's something that we can do on television now. You couldn't do it back then in a and movie. Then- yeah, yeah. The other thing, too, is you, you see a lot more apes being shot. You, it's a lot more squibs of apes being mm-hmm. shot and stuff like that. You seeing it. Uh, there's one that I, I really noticed where suddenly, like, a human gets thrown in the foreground and then a gun goes off and you blatantly see a guy get shot in the head and his blood go all over the wall in the background. Wow. In, in the background. And so and it was just something in the background. There's one where a human gets thrown through the glass and you just suddenly see him land and there's blood everywhere all over the glass, all over him. But there's two parts where I also noticed it a lot as well. Uh, before they storm ape control, they build a fire. The apes build this huge bonfire and are like throwing wood and, and desks and chairs and anything they can find on this fire just to make it bigger. In the theatrical cut, you see them stacking a couple of bodies once, maybe twice, and then it cuts to them just going to the bonfire, making it big before they start charging towards ape control. In the unrated cut, and this is very deliberate, it cross cuts back and forth. They'll throw a piece of wood on the bonfire, a dead body will be stacked on top of another. They'll throw another <laughs> pe- they'll they'll throw another thing onto the bonfire, more bodies getting tossed onto a pile oh, that's of dead beautiful. bodies. And I mean that first of all, what a testament to the editing of the movie. And it's not like they're just dead bond, just like people playing dead. These guys are coated with fake blood. <laughs> they they have holes in their chests. They're right that the helmets that they have are like smashed in. One is completely covered in blood, implying that it was pushed into his <laughs> and I'm like, oh. I mean, it's tame. Don't get me wrong, for today's standards. But, sure. at the, but at the same time, it's shot and edited in this way that I think it's more effective than a lot of the shit that we see today. And well, I know, and I feel kind of bad, Oliver, because I know you haven't seen the unrated cut, because as far as I know, the only way to watch it is with these 40th anniversary Blu-rays that I have. Mm. Because the version that's on Hulu, which is what you watched, is is the theatrical cut. Right. The other one, too, the other the other very noticeable one, is when they're dragging... Breck outside when they throw him down on the steps before Caesar Mm -hmm. you know like an offering and they don't just show Breck sort of not really groveling there but just kind of being not knowing what the apes are going to do they start stacking dead bodies around him and he's forced to watch it Uh, all of these dead guys (laughs) around him Look and, what we and did. Seeing that is what triggers McDonald to call for Caesar and say, "This isn't the way. Mm-hmm. This, this isn't the way." That's what kicks off that whole dialogue in the unrated right. version. Is is wow, McDonald that, that seeing is, that? That is an incredibly different take because, and I I feel I prefer that because this is a movie about how violence begets more violence. Yeah. It needs more violence. Yes. That whole bit of dialogue exchange between Caesar and Breck is phenomenal. It's the same in both versions. And and you have Breck. Breck looks up in a shock to see Caesar because he thinks Caesar is dead. And I love how Caesar goes, your servant, your creature, your animal. And he just gets angrier and angrier as it goes along. And then Breck goes, I saw you die. And, and Caesar goes, the king is dead. Long live the king. Long live the king. And then he asks Breck, why did you do this to us? Why have you done this to us? What did we do to you? And Breck gives a genuine chilling answer. When we repress you, we are repressing the dark side of ourselves. And he also introduces the the concept inside every human, there is still an ape curled up in there. Because yeah. we came from you. Mm-hmm. And that is also what this franchise is about, is that we started started as apes, and now we're going back to being apes. Right. And I do love that bit, though, where Caesar starts shaking. He gets so angry. He starts shaking, and he lifts his gun ready to just bash Breck's head in. And he stops. And almost, because if you watch the unrated cut, almost more sadistically, he's like, no, take him outside. So they do. They bring him outside. And the, the, that leads to the biggest difference of the unrated version versus the theatrical cut. Theatrical cut, we have that second speech. The, the uplifting unra- one. Yeah, the uplifting one. In 
the unrated version, Caesar gives that initial angry speech, which is one of my favorite speeches of all time ever written. The shots linger on Caesar, right? And you have the fire burning behind him. And there's one shot where there's, it's, it's, this is why working with practical stuff is bad. It's great because you get little moments like this. Sure. The fire burns in front of Caesar really quick, revealing his face. And it's so horrifying. It is genuinely scary how angry Caesar is. And he is terrifying to the point that it scares Lisa. You notice how Lisa is there watching Caesar and she turns her back to him because she's scared Mm -hmm. of what Caesar's turned into. And in the unrated cut, when Caesar points and says, now the apes then eviscerate Governor Breck. You don't see it, but you just know that they're now beating him to death with clubs and axes and knives and everything, and he's just gone. And that's the end of the movie. Woof. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can see why they would uh, change that. <laughs> I mean, no, do we is get, that as... Do we get is, the beat down on the cereal box? I mean, is it as bleak as Beneath? No. <laughs> no. Is it darker than Beneath? But Beneath I would is argue. dealing with nuclear holocaust in <laughs> the end of the world. <laughs> yeah. Period. This the the yeah the theatrical cut. I mean, it ends the same. Don't get me wrong. You have that epic music that's playing from mm-hmm. the first film that was taken from the first film, and the camera like pushes in on Caesar, who's just so angry. It's uh, it's again one of the most angry films I have ever seen. Is <laughs> this film, and that's how the movie ends. And I'm like, what is it with these movies? And just shocking endings. <laughs> yeah. Just turning it on you at every turn. Well, that goes back to, again, this is not a... Maybe at this point they knew franchise, we're doing another, right? Mm-hmm. But it's not Planet of the Apes Phase 1. It's not keep this going because we're bringing this audience back. Every one of these is supposed to be the end. Right. You know? Right. So what's the logical conclusion to this franchise? It's that. It's terrible violence making way for a new society that is not going to do much better. Mm -hmm. The unrated version really solidifies that. Really solidifies that. That violence isn't the answer. It's just going to lead to more violence. And how do they do that? By showing a lot of violence. And the, the theatrical cut waters that down. And certainly the Caesar from the theatrical cut just from that end speech, is the Caesar we get in the next movie. But it is quite clear that Paul Dane, actually even before this movie was finished, was already kind of working on the next movie, which mm-hmm. didn't happen before. That wasn't right. ha- they, they would just write that movie and say one and done. Wait and see. This movie, they yeah. already said, probably the next one's going to be the last movie because they had a feeling that the next film was going to be the last movie just because yeah. the, 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 the returns for these movies had been going down. Right. Sure. They were still making a fuck ton of money, but they've been going down. So they're like, probably the next one's going to be the last. So Paul Dane was already kind of working on that. If you look at some of the original treatments for the next movie, it is quite clear that he was basing that off of the Caesar from the ending of the unrated version, not the one from the theatrical. A militant of Caesar. A very not a savior Caesar. A very militant Caesar, Oliver. <laughs> Oliver. God, I love these movies. I I. You know what? I'll say it. I'll say it. I almost like this one more than the original. I know or the original See, one is objectively the best movie. Of course. Well, the original is also the classic. I, you know what? That's interesting, too. I, I would call the original film a classic. No ifs, ands, or about it. I would call the sequels cult classics. Yes. The, the rest of the franchise is made up of cult classics. Yes. Yeah. But the original is the timeless, embedded in our pop culture, in Mm -hmm. our cultural zeitgeist movie. Mm -hmm. I think this stands on its own equally if you take that away, though. Like, if you just measure them on their own merits, Mm -hmm. this is just as good as that. This movie really... It's just perhaps more upsetting. Subjectively, in terms of the stuff that I like to see, the types of movies that I like to watch and everything Mm -hmm. like that, this movie is it. This is this is the one that I like to watch the most. 
it's a lot so of it funny. having to do with just how good I find a lot of the dialogue in this movie and the performances of everyone in the film. For sure. And and it's so funny how like the ape sequels took such a turn for the better when they came to our world. Like when it be mm-hmm. it's almost like and I love Beneath, but it's almost like they said everything they needed to say in that original Apes yes. movie. Yeah. And I am a big believer that a franchise can take a blatant right turn and fix things up. And that gives it so much more cultural significance, so much more like lasting relevance for it to be taking place somewhere that we recognize. Right. And perhaps that's why this is so upsetting. You want to know out of the, the audiences that watch this movie, which again, this movie had a 1.9, just about a $2 million budget and it made $9 million back. So a healthy, a healthy return. But the audience with this movie wasn't kids like the other film. No, this is an adult's film. The audience that went, for lack of a better term, ape shit over this movie? <laughs> African Americans. Of course. They were the biggest audience for this film. I get it. Yeah. Because what is this movie about? It is reflective of their cultural experience. I believe it was the actor that played Governor Breck said at one of the screenings that he went to in New York City. It was a largely African American community uh, watching or watching the film. You know, mm-hmm. it was a, a, an audience watching the film, and he said during the revolution sequence they were going apoplectic. I'm sure they. It was because like watching a wrestling match. How could you watch it and not relate to it if that was your lot in life at that time? Exactly, exactly. And I'm like, wow, okay, that's interesting. But that was not the audience. That it 20th was intended century, for. Yes, that was not, and and that is not the audience 20th Century Fox wanted. Which is why we see that abrupt shift for the sequel and not to get ahead of ourselves but battle is a totally different thing a totally different thing as a result they they, through that cut they were the theatrical cut they were able to get it down to a pg which was still a big deal right pg pg back then did not mean the pg of today no there was still nudity in pg back then yeah there was still there was still a lot of stuff that you could do in pg that you yeah i love this movie me I too, love Adam. this movie. I fucking love this movie. I think this movie is genuinely fantastic. I love this movie. I love this franchise. This is one you could talk. We could sit here for five hours and talk about this, and we, we would could still look, be yeah. yielding new yeah. points. Caesar is real, and I feel him, Adam. <laughs> I feel Caesar. Um, I feel him in everything that I do. God hmm. bless our monkey overlord. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching this episode of Go Ape. We conclude Go Ape next week. Yes, we battle, do. Battle for the Planet of the Apes. Oliver, why don't you pimp yourself out, my friend? Hey, everybody. Oliver the Ricketts here. Uh, societal sweetheart, internet menace. Um, you can find me over on my channel, Other Productions and Media, where I talk about all kinds of things under the sun. We're very into social experiments. Recently, I was baptized in a pool, and we did it to talk about atheism. Uh, So if that's the kind of thing that you like to see, check me out over there. Or if you want to see me talk about movies, uh, find me on Designing Hollywood talking about different movies from all different eras. And we're getting guests on there too that are somewhat involved with the movies that we'll be talking about. And links to both of those channels are in the description below. Of course, you can find all my social media also in the description below. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for tuning into this episode of Go Ape. And we'll see you one more time next week. Take care.